Today's topic is the circular waveguide. So we've talked previously about rectangular, uh, the rectangular waveguide, and now we're going to look at the same kind of structure but with a circular cross section. So this would look something uh, like a pipe. Cylindrical structure. And we take the z-axis to be the axis of the cylinder. And we're looking for fields that more or less propagate in the z-direction. So it has z-dependence, e to the minus j, beta, z, z. For the cross-section, x, y plane here. Cross-section would be circular. And we'll take a radius of a. And then in our cylindrical coordinates, we have the angle phi, and then the uh, radial distance rho, and at rho is equal to A, that's our surface. So what are the boundary conditions? All right, so remember to solve Maxwell's equations, we first have a general solution, typically of the Helmholtz equation, and then we apply boundary conditions to get a specific solution. So here, we're going to assume that this is a PEC, perfect electric conductor, and therefore, the tangential components of the electric field must vanish. They're shorted out. So what are the tangential components? So at some point in space, in cylindrical coordinates, we've got an A rho hat unit vector and an A phi hat unit vector. And then out of the screen, or in this picture, in the direction of the z-axis, you've got an a z-hat unit vector. So two of those components are tangential to this cylindrical surface, a z-hat and a phi-hat. A rho-hat is normal, so we have no constraints on the e rho, but we must have that e phi is equal to e z is equal to zero at rho is equal to a. And just to be clear, this means that this is, this is true for all values of phi from 0 to 2 pi and all values of z from plus to minus infinity. As we did for rectangular cross-section waveguides, we're going to break up our solutions into two classes. One is where we take an electric vector potential that has only a z component. And that z component is a function of the three coordinates, rho, phi, and z. All those t easy modes, because as we know, there will be no easy component. So they are transverse. Uh, the electric field is transverse to the z direction. And then we'll take, in the other case, a magnetic vector potential that has only a z component that depends on rho, phi, and z, and we call those the TMZ modes. Because in those modes, the magnetic field is transverse to the z direction. There is no HZ component. Now, our typical approach is we put in our general solution in the particular coordinate system and then impose these boundary conditions. Obviously, to impose boundary conditions on the electric field, we need to know what the, uh, how the electric fields are related to the vector potentials. So for the TEZ case, the non-zero tangential component uh, because there's no EZ component, so the only one we have to worry about is E phi. E phi, we derived this in a previous uh, lecture, is 1 over epsilon times the rho derivative of FZ. Now, let's assume that our waveguide, which is bounded by a perfect electrical conductor, in the interior has permeability mu and permittivity epsilon. And we'll just leave those as general uh, parameters for now. All right, so this is what our boundary condition boils down to. 
for the TEZ case. And of course, we need to use solutions of Maxwell's equations. And that means, as we've seen, this the FZ must be a solution of the Helmholtz equation, the FZ component. And we worked out what those solutions look like. And in general, we could have this in our separation of variables uh, solution. We could have an overall amplitude F0, we'll call it. And then a linear, uh, excuse me, a linear con combination of J nu beta rho rho and y nu beta rho rho Bessel functions of the first and second kind of order nu times a linear combination of cosine nu phi and sine nu phi and then because we're interested in fields that propagate in the z direction we're only going to have a factor e to the minus beta, uh, e to the minus j beta z z for the z dependence. Now, if we're looking at more general fields, we could have had a linear combination of e to the plus and minus j beta z z. Now, as far as the electric field vanishing, it looks like we only have one boundary condition. That's, that is that rho is equal to A, whereas in the rectangular wave guide, right, we would have, uh, for each dimension, two boundary conditions, like at the left and the right, or the top and the bottom. But there really is an implicit boundary condition at rho is equal to zero, because that's part right here at the center, at the axis of the cylinder. That's part of the solution domain. And we know that y nu of x blows up, goes to plus or minus infinity as x goes to zero. So implicit in our solution is that the fields can't blow up, they can't become infinite. And therefore we, we must exclude the second kind of Bessel functions from our solution. Because again, in, in a sense, they, they fail the boundary condition that rho is equal to zero, that the fields must be finite. So we're only going to have j nu, beta rho rho. And now as far as the phi dependence, well, this structure has complete circular symmetry. We can rotate it around the z-axis as much as we want, and the problem looks the same. So it really doesn't matter whether we take cosine or sine or some linear combination. And what we can do instead, if we want, we could take a general linear combination and express it as cosine nu phi minus phi zero. With trig identities, you can express this as a linear combination of these two factors there. And that just tells us explicitly that we can rotate this by some arbitrary offset angle phi zero and we still have a solution. Now another implicit boundary condition is over phi. If we go start at, say phi is equal to zero and we go around a circle and come back to phi is equal to 2 pi, well, physically, we've come back to the same point we started at. And so the fields are literally the same fields we started with. And therefore, our mathematical solution must be periodic in the phi coordinate with a period of 2 pi. So our phi dependence has period 2 pi. And the way to get that with a function of the form cosine nu phi minus phi zero is that nu must be equal to m, which is an integer. So with those constraints, we're going to be looking for solutions of the form fc is equal to f zero, j sub m, beta rho rho, cosine m phi minus phi zero, e to the minus j beta z z. And recall from a previous lecture that this is a solution of the Helmholtz equation provided 
beta rho squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared, which is equal to omega squared mu epsilon. So that's a relation then between the beta z and the beta rho. M can be any integer. All right, now, so if this is our solution that we're assuming, and our only boundary condition in this case is that the phi component is equal to zero, and the phi component is proportional to the rho derivative of f sub z, then we must have that the rho derivative of f sub z is equal to zero. is equal to zero. And this is at rho is equal to a. So it's a boundary condition in the coordinate rho. And all the rho dependence comes through this jm beta rho rho factor. So the derivative of that would give you beta rho jm prime beta rho, and rho is evaluated at a. And that must be equal to zero. The other terms, they don't uh, in any way affect the value as a function of rho. So that factor alone must disappear, it must be equal to zero. And if we assume that beta rho is not equal to zero, then this requires that jm prime beta rho a is equal to zero. So let's look at jm prime just of x is equal to zero. Now that's not as simple as we talked about the Bessel functions previously. Uh, they're, they look a little bit like sines and cosines uh, divided by a square root of x, at least for large arguments. But they're not exactly periodic. So we don't have nice simple formulas for the zeros of the functions or their derivatives. But we can numerically go through and calculate these zeros. And so if we look here at, here's the, the first, first zero, the second zero, and the third zero. And this would be for j0 prime of x, and then j1 prime of x, and j2 prime of x, and you can go on. Um, the first zero for j0 prime occurs at about 3. 8.3, the next at about 7.02, and the third at about uh, 10.17. For the J1 derivative, the first zero occurs at 1.84, uh, the second at about 5.33, and the third at about 8.54. For J2 prime, the first zero occurs at about 4.2, the second at about 8.02, and the third at about 11.35. So any one of these zeros is going to satisfy this condition. So we take a particular value of m, and then go through this table, or find the zeros ourselves, um, some, in some fashion, numerically or whatever, and that's then going to be the condition for what? Well, it's going to be the condition for beta rho. Let's call these values here chi prime sub m n. All right, so m is the order of the Bessel function. The prime means it's a zero of the derivative of that Bessel function. So the m is the order of the Bessel function, and n is the number of the zeros. So this is the first zero, second zero, et cetera. So our condition jm prime beta rho a is equal to zero requires that beta rho times, sorry, beta rho times a must be chi prime mn, and so beta rho must be chi prime mn over a. And that defines largely that particular mode. So we have solutions when beta rho 
is equal to chi prime mn over a. And since beta rho squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared is omega squared mu epsilon, we can solve for beta z. Beta z is the square root beta squared and it's beta rho squared. And because of this solution for beta rho, that's the square root of beta squared minus chi prime mn over a squared. And now we can see we're going to have a cutoff condition. If the frequency gets small enough that this first term is less than the second term, then this difference will be negative and we'll have the square root of a negative number, right? An imaginary phase constant, and the field then will decay exponentially. It'll be an evanescent field. It will not propagate. And so that defines a cutoff condition. So here we have omega squared mu epsilon would be equal to chi prime mn over a squared. And from that, and the fact that, of course, omega is equal to 2 times pi times the frequency f in hertz, we get the cutoff frequency for the MNTEZ mode, FTECMN, which is 1 over 2 pi we'll divided by the square root of mu epsilon. That times chi mn prime over a. So that's the cutoff frequency for the mn tez mode. Now, if you look at that short table we had of the chi prime mn values, the smallest is will give us the smallest cutoff frequency is chi prime 1 1 which is 1 1.8412 to four decimal places and so that would be the minimum tez cutoff frequencies of all the cutoff frequencies that would be the smallest and we'll see that would be the smallest of if we also include the tmz modes so this will actually end up being what we call the dominant mode. The one that can be used in single mode operation. We can operate over a range of frequencies for which only this mode can propagate. So with a solution like that, either, either the MN is equal to 1, 1 or any other uh, solution, we then have to work out what the, uh, the field vector, the components are, all the components. We want to have a complete solution for our field. And so E rho is minus 1 over epsilon rho times the phi derivative of Fz. And we've already seen that E phi is 1 over epsilon times the rho derivative of Fz. For TEZ modes, there's no Z component of the electric field. If we go back to our lecture on cylindrical coordinates where we worked out all the components due to uh, Z component of the electric vector potential. Uh, there we saw that H rho is 1 over J omega mu epsilon times the second derivative with respect to rho and z of fz and h v is 1 over j omega u epsilon 1 over rho times the second derivative with respect to phi and z of fz and h z is 1 over 
j omega u epsilon times beta squared fz plus the second derivative with respect to z of f z. And this one actually is pretty easy because the z dependence of fz is e to the minus j beta zz. And so two derivatives bring down a factor of minus j beta z all squared, which is minus beta z squared. So this becomes beta squared minus b squared fz, which because beta squared minus beta z squared is just beta rho squared, that's beta rho squared fz. So that one's pretty easy. All right, so now we go through for our particular solution. fz is f0. Jm, beta rho rho, and um, we're doing this with uh, cosine dependence, cosine m v minus v zero, e to the minus j beta z z, and we do these operations, and here's what we obtain. E rho is F zero. So for E rho, we've got a, a phi derivative. So that brings out a factor of M. And we've got over epsilon rho, J M, beta rho rho. Derivative of the cosine, you get a minus a sine. And that minus sine cancels that minus sine there. So sine m v minus v zero e to the minus j beta z z for e phi we get f zero so for e phi we've got a, a row derivative so when we take a row derivative chain rule is going to bring out a factor of beta rho add a one over epsilon and then we'll have j m prime beta rho rho and we've got no derivative in phi so we go, have the cosine behavior and our z dependence ez of course is equal to zero and now for the h components that h rho one over this factor. Derivative with respect to z brings down a minus j beta z uh, factor out in front, and then that j and, and this j will cancel, and that'll leave a minus sign because of the minus j beta z. And so what we end up there with, with uh, is minus f0. And we also have a rho derivative, so that'll bring out a beta rho by the chain rule. So we got a beta rho and a beta z over omega mu epsilon. We had a rho derivative, so jm prime, beta rho rho, and we had no phi derivative, so we still have the cosine. And the same z dependence. Then for h phi, is our h phi. So we have a z derivative that brings down a minus j beta z, and that j and that j cancel. And we have a minus sign. But then we also have a phi derivative, and that takes derivative of the cosine, that becomes minus sine. So those two minus signs cancel and leaves us with a sign there and brings out also a factor of m. So this ends up giving us f0, m beta z, one from the phi derivative, one from the z derivative over omega mu epsilon, one over rho, jm beta rho rho. We had a phi derivative, so we've got sine here, m phi minus phi zero, 
and our Z dependents. And then finally, we already worked out uh, eight HZ, that is simply HZ, then looks like what we'll do here, the one over J we'll write as minus J up top. We'll have minus J, we had an F zero, got beta rho squared, and that's from that guy right there, beta rho squared over omega mu epsilon, jm beta rho rho, cosine in phi, and our z dependence. So there's our solution uh, for any value of m, as long as we set beta rho is chi prime m n over a, then we can from that calculate the beta z, and then here is our, our solutions for the field. Now, we saw that in rectangular course, the idea of a wave impedance was very useful. So here's rho and here's angle phi. If we're at some point here in the xy plane, there is an a rho hat unit vector and there's an a phi hat unit vector. So a rho hat and a phi hat are orthogonal. So it was the ratio of orthogonal electric and magnetic fields that led to the idea of the wave impedance. So let's do that here. Let's take the e rho divided by the h phi. What are we going to get here? Um, so notice you've got jm sine and the, the exponential. And down here, you've got jm sine and the exponential. So all these three factors are the same. So those will cancel out. The f0, of course, cancels out. The m cancels out. An epsilon cancels out. And a rho cancels out. And what that leaves is that uh, e rho over h v is equal to omega mu over the beta z. Okay, so m over epsilon rho, those all cancel out and just leaves, since you're dividing by h phi, one over beta z over omega mu or omega mu over beta z. If you take then e phi over minus h rho, right, because this would be, if e was in the phi direction, then 90 degrees in a right-hand sense from that would be in the minus a rho hat direction. So if you take e phi over minus h rho, that gets rid of that minus sign. And you see here, these have the same jm prime cosine factor and the exponential. F zero cancels, um, beta rho over epsilon cancels, and you're left with, when you take this guy over that, omega mu over beta z. And so we define that to be the wave impedance. The wave impedance is omega mu over beta z. So for the tangential, well, let's say this, the transverse to the z direction, magnetic field and the electric field components, uh, orthogonal components are related just by this ratio being equal to this wave impedance. So now let's look at TMZ modes. In this case, we take AZ, Z component of the magnetic vector potential. To be the source of our fields, we write it's equal to A0. We have the same argument that the fields have to be finite at rho is equal to zero, so we only have the first type of Bessel function, JM beta rho rho, and we'll have cosine M phi minus phi zero. All right, so that represents an arbitrary linear combination of cosine m phi and sine m phi, and then our propagation in the z direction due to the e to the minus j beta z z factor. Now, in this case, we will have an ez component, and at the 
cylinder surface, we have EZ tangential and E phi tangential. Those both have to be equal to zero. Well, E phi is proportional to um, the phi derivative of the Z derivative of AZ. And EZ is proportional, uh, just like we had HC in the previous, in the TEZ case, in the TMZ case, EZ is proportional to beta rho squared times AZ. So this term obviously is proportional just to the, our AZ expression. And so since this boundary condition is that rho is equal to A, it's the rho dependence factor that controls that. And so this would say that we need to have JM beta rho A be equal to zero. And how about this one? Well, this has two derivatives, but they're in phi and z, so they don't touch the, the rho factor. So we still have, after taking these derivatives, we still have that JM beta rho A has to be equal to zero. So that condition will satisfy both of these tangential components being equal to zero. So we need the zeros now of not of the derivative of JM, but of JM itself. So let's say that JM of chi MN is equal to zero are the zeros of these functions. Let's make a little table. There's N, one, two, and three. And here's J zero of X, J one of X, and J two of X. And this is 2.4 uh o to three to two decimal places five point five two eight point six five three point eight three seven point oh two and ten point one seven and we plotted these uh best various Bessel functions out in the uh in the lecture on Bessel functions j two is a uh, five point one Four, eight point four two, and eleven point six two, and so you see here that the the lowest, smallest cutoff or smallest zero, which is going to lead to the lowest smallest cutoff frequency, is about two point four zero, and so that would be that chi zero one, the first zero of j zero of x, which is let's put more digits now, is two point. 4048 is going to be the lowest cutoff. So in this case, right, since this has to be, the, the chi is going to be equal to beta rho A, then beta rho must be equal to these chi values over A. So for the TEZ case, they were the chi primes, that were the zeros of the derivatives of the Bessel function. For the TMZ case, they're just the chi's, which are the zeros of the Bessel function. So we choose an M and an N. That's one of these values. That fixes our beta rho. And as before, our beta Z will then be square root of beta squared minus beta rho squared, which is chi M N over A. squared and we find then a cutoff when beta squared is equal to chi m n over a and that defines now the tm cutoffs of the m nth mode and that looks just like our expression for the te case 1 over 2 pi root mu epsilon um, instead of chi prime mn is just chi mn over a. And of course, the, the lowest of those will be when you have the smallest chi mn, and that's the 2.4048 value there. Notice that uh, chi 0, 01 is 2.4048 is larger than chi prime 1, 1. Um, which is our value of uh, 
And that says that that mode is the dominant mode. That is the mode that we can set the frequency so that we operate so that only that mode can propagate, that single mode operation. So having solved for our beta rho, we now can go back and take this expression and do all the calculations we need in order to get the, um, the E and the H components. So what we find is H rho is minus A zero M over mu rho JM beta rho rho times sine due to our B derivative and our Z dependence. H phi is minus A zero beta rho over mu times JM prime from a rho derivative, beta rho rho, cosine, hz is zero, this is a TMZ mode, and the E components are E rho is minus A zero, we have a rho derivative and a z derivative, brings out the beta z, rho and beta z, or mega mu epsilon, j m prime because of the rho derivative, beta rho rho, cosine, and phi, and e phi is a zero, there's a phi derivative, brings out an m, and there's a z derivative, brings out a beta z, omega mu epsilon rho, jm beta rho rho, phi derivative, so we get a sine, And finally, EZ minus J, A0 beta rho squared over omega mu epsilon, JM beta rho rho, cosine factor, and the Z phase factor. So in most applications, it's the dominant mode that we care about. And that dominant mode is, as we talked previously, the TEZ11 mode. And that has beta rho, uh, or, I'm sorry, has corresponds to the zero chi prime one one, which is one point eight four one two, a cutoff frequency, which is one over two pi root u epsilon chi one one, sorry, chi prime one one over a and beta z, which can be written as beta, which is omega, which is two pi f, times root mu epsilon, times the square root of one minus its cutoff frequency over the operating frequency squared. So that's your beta z, and that of course makes it clear that when f is equal to the cutoff frequency, this is one minus one, the beta z goes to zero. So for this special case, m is equal to one. Uh, here are the non-zero field components. 
Ebro, and we're going to write the coefficient. We're going to define E0 is equal to F0 times beta rho over 2 epsilon, and then the coefficients expressed nicely as 2E0 over beta rho rho by including that factor in there with this definition, right? That would just mean I'm letting F0 be 2 epsilon E0 over beta rho, and that beta rho gives me a factor to combine with the rho. So rho has dimensions of meters, beta rho of inverse meters combined, they're dimensionless, so that's always nice. And then E0 is going to turn out to be the maximum electric field strength for E rho. And this would be, it's the M is equal to 1 mode, J1, beta rho, rho, right, where beta rho is this value over A. Sine, M is equal to 1, so it's just sine phi minus phi 0, E to the minus J beta Z, Z. E phi with this same definition for F0 is 2 E0 J1 prime beta rho rho cosine phi minus phi 0 Z dependence. Of course, EZ is equal to 0. TE Z mode. And what you can do here, you can look at how this behaves as rho goes uh, to zero on J1 of X behaves, or small x, essentially as X over two. And so here you'd have beta rho over two, that beta rho would cancel this and the over two would cancel that and just leave E zero. And then here you can take the derivative of that, that would just be one half, one half cancels that two and that leaves E zero. So that means that as rho goes to zero, E rho and E phi both go to E zero. So that's a convenient definition. So continuing on, H rho, well, um, e phi over minus h rho is z. So h rho is just minus 1 over z times e phi. And h phi, well, e rho over h phi is 1 over z. So h phi is just 1 over z e rho. And then HZ is minus J 2E0 over Z, beta rho over beta Z, J1, beta rho rho, cosine V minus V0, E to the minus J beta Z, Z. And again, Z is omega mu over beta Z, the TEZ wave impedance. So when we go to calculate the pointing vector, which shows the intensity of uh, the field, the power flow, right, that's one half the real part of E cross H conjugate. And so remembering our unit vectors here, we'll have E rho and E phi and H phi and minus H rho. So in this cross product, you're going to get E rho times H phi and then E phi times minus h rho. So this becomes, it's all going to be in the z direction. So it'll be one half a z hat. And why is that? Because the way we've written these fields out here, uh, if e0 is equal is real, 
then these are all real fields, and then this is, has a J, so this is imaginary. When you take the cross product of real and imaginary, well, the real part of that is zero, because it's purely imaginary. So the HZ doesn't contribute to the pointing vector, right? This is the time average power flow. So this becomes one half AZ, E rho, H phi, minus E phi, H rho, and the H's are conjugated. And that means that when you take this product, you're going to get E to the minus J beta Z, Z times E to the plus J beta Z, Z, and those cancel out. And so what you end up with then is that this is equal to magnitude V0 squared, allowing E0 to possibly be complex, over, and the H's have the Z in their expressions, and they're conjugated, so over Z conjugate. And then from these factors here, you get J1 squared, beta rho rho, over beta rho rho squared, times sine squared, B minus B0, plus J1 prime squared, beta rho rho times the cosine squared, phi minus phi zero. And that is your pointing vector. So let's look at this uh, picture of this distribution. So here we have the field line. So if you just start at any particular point, and you calculate the electric field, and you just keep moving in the direction of the electric field, you'll trace out these lines. The electric field is everywhere tangent to these curves. So the solid blue lines are the electric field, and the dashed red lines are the magnetic field. They're everywhere orthogonal, and that's where the, the way that the field lines would run. And then if you calculate our pointing vector here and plot that in the plane z is equal to zero, this is the intensity where white is the most intense down to black is the least intense. So you've got this kind of oblong, high intensity little lobe there in the, the center of the waveguide. Very little intensity on the left to right and moderate on the top and bottom. And remember, there's this arbitrary, and by the way, these are both for phi is equal to zero. Um, if you let phi, be an, phi zero be an arbitrary angle, you just rotate all of these distributions around from zero to 360 degrees, however much you want. Because of the rotational symmetry of this circular cross section, there's nothing that specifies or prefers any particular direction for this, these lines. They could, you could rotate them by 45 degrees or whatever. Now, an interesting variation on what we've been talking about is coaxial cable. And in this case, we've got our cylindrical waveguide, radius A. And then we put a coaxial cylinder of smaller radius, say B, inside. And these are both conducting PEC, ideally PEC surfaces. In between, we've got material with permeability mu and permittivity epsilon. So this is an interesting wrinkle. One of the things is that because, right, this means that the, the solution domain does not include the origin, rho is equal to zero. The solution domain is from rho from B to A. Um, it's still the case that phi can go from zero to two pi, and of course z can vary over all values but we exclude the origin. And that means if, for example, we were to look at t easy modes in this case, our fz could have an arbitrary combination of the two type of Bessel functions. Let's say a, jm, beta rho rho, that's a rho, plus b of the second kind of Bessel function, ym, beta rho rho. And um, cosine m phi e to the minus j beta z z. 
Now the boundary conditions are that E phi, and of course there's no EZ component for a TEZ mode, so it would just be E phi is equal to zero at rho is equal to A and B, two different values of rho. There's no longer a condition that the fields be finite at the origin. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at E phi, it's proportional to the rho derivative of Fz. And that rho derivative is going to have a factor, A, Jm prime, times beta rho, rho, plus B, Ym prime, beta rho, rho, and then the chain rule would bring out another factor of beta rho, which we just will ignore for now. And uh, that's got to be equal to zero at, uh, at A. So let's actually go back and put in A here for rho. And then also at B, there would be a second equation, A, J, M, beta rho, B, plus B, Y, M prime, beta rho, B, is equal to zero. So that's what the boundary conditions would look like in this case. We've got two equations and two unknowns. Now, there's a trivial solution, which would just be A is equal to B is equal to zero. And if these two equations are linearly independent, then that's the only solution there is. There's a unique solution, and it's that trivial case where there's no fields. So to get a non-trivial solution, these two equations must be just a, a, a multiple of one another. Or another way to think about that is we can break this up into a matrix formalism, Jm prime, beta rho A, Ym prime, beta rho A. And for the next line, Jm prime, beta rho B, Ym prime, beta rho B times a, b has to be equal to zero, zero. So put it in this form, obviously if this matrix is invertible, there's the trivial, only the trivial solution, a is equal to b is equal to zero. For there to be a non-trivial solution, the determinant of this matrix must be zero. So that, that means these two equations are just, they're linearly dependent, they're just multiples of one another. And so the determinant of that matrix would just be the, the cross this times that minus that times that, that would be jm, beta rho A times Ym, and these are all prime, sorry, Ym prime, beta rho B minus Jm prime, beta rho B times Ym prime, beta rho A has to be equal to zero. And what you could do then is to simply plot that function and find where the zeros are. So let's take a look at that. So here is that function, the determinant of that matrix we were looking at. It's the blue curve, and then here's a zero. And you can see here, here would be a solution. That's so that would be one mode. Here'd be another solution, a second mode, a third mode, and so on. So you could then numerically or graphically figure out the values of beta rho, and this was particularly for m is equal to 1, a is 1, b is equal to 0.25. This would then give you the values of beta rho that would give you these various modes. These would be the uh, m equals 1, n equals 1, 2, and 3 modes in that particular waveguide. They would be the TEZ modes. Now, for if you did this same process with the TMZ modes, you get this same expression without the prime. So you get JM, beta rho A, YM, beta rho B, minus JM, beta rho B, YM, beta rho a is equal to zero. And we have the same kind of process for finding the beta rho values. In either case, you're going to get some 
beta rho um, greater than zero, and then you're going to get cutoff, cutoff frequency when beta z is equal to the square root beta squared minus beta rho squared is equal to zero, which is when beta rho becomes beta. So they'll all have cutoff frequencies. Now, now for the coaxial cable, there's an interesting solution uh, that you, you don't get uh, something corresponding to for just the circular waveguide. And that is, let's imagine, let's start with this solution. F sub z is F zero, J sub nu, where nu is not necessarily integer here, beta rho rho, sine nu phi, e to the minus j beta z, z. Okay. And so if we look at a solution of that form, right, it'll be a solution as long as beta rho squared plus beta z squared is equal to beta squared. Now, for now, just forget about the requirement that this, has to, this field has to be periodic in phi with period 2 pi because we're going to do something, we're going to take a limit that's going to get rid of that problem here. So nu here can be any real number. So let's see, the non-zero electric field components are E rho is minus 1 over epsilon rho, the phi derivative of Fz. And that will be minus F0 from the phi derivative, we get a factor of nu from the chain rule over epsilon and then a 1 over rho here. And then we've got j nu beta rho rho. And the sine derivative is the cosine and e to the minus j beta z z and e phi is 1 over epsilon the row derivative of f z, and that's going to get you, um, let's see, we'll have an f0 over epsilon. The row derivative will bring out a factor of beta rho. Put it up here. j nu prime, beta rho rho, sine nu phi, e to the minus j, beta z, z. Okay, and we haven't said anything about what, what rho is. So now let's do something interesting. Let's let, suppose we set beta rho is equal to nu. And we let those both go to zero. And just mathematically, let's do that. Uh, so this is going to become j zero, and this is going to become sine of zero here. But notice what happens. In this case, you got a new there, and j zero of zero is equal to one, which is also equal to the cosine of zero, whereas j prime zero uh, at zero is equal to the sine of zero is equal to zero. And in this limit, the beta rho goes to zero, then beta z is the square root of beta squared minus beta rho squared, but beta rho squared goes to zero, so it's just equal to beta. And nu goes to zero, and let's see, so e phi here, well, sine of zero is zero, and j zero prime at zero is equal to zero, so this all goes away, this goes to zero. But how about this guy? Cosine goes to one. <clears throat> j, this becomes j zero, um, at beta rho goes to zero, so j0 is zero, 0 is 1. And then let's take f0 um, to be minus e0 b epsilon over nu. Right? This is arbitrary constant, so let's just set it for any value of nu is equal to rho. Let's set it equal to this. And then in that limit, that nu cancels that nu, this epsilon cancels that epsilon, and you're left with a minus sign cancels E0B over rho. And so what we end up with then are the electric field E rho 
is E0 of the, the B here, B over rho, E to the minus J, and beta Z becomes beta, and that's it. Because E phi, we said, just goes to zero, and E Z is equal to zero because it's a T Z field. Then we can use Faraday's law, the curl of E is minus J omega mu H, and that's pretty easy here because E has only a, a row component. And from that, it's easy to show that H has only a phi component. H phi is beta over omega mu, E zero, B over rho, E to the minus J, beta Z, Z. And, um, well, let's turn it this way. Omega mu over beta is omega mu over beta is omega root mu epsilon. So that just leaves a root mu over epsilon, which is the intrinsic impedance of the material. And so we then have this for the fields. E rho is E zero. B over rho, e to the minus j, beta z, and h phi is e zero over eta, beta over rho, e to the minus j, beta z. If we didn't have this one over rho factor there, this would just look like a plane wave with, with two orthogonal components. Here's your e rho, and there's your h phi. Uh, but you've got a, a row dependence there. And you can see why these would not be valid solutions in the circular waveguide, because at row goes to zero, they blow up. But in the uh, coaxial cable, we don't have to worry about row is equal to zero. We only go from between row is equal to B to A. And so these, this is a TEMZ mode. And because beta z is just equal to beta, there's no cutoff. Beta rho is equal to zero. This thing can go down to arbitrary low frequencies. And in fact, that's how coaxial cables are typically used. Uh, they're used at frequencies low enough that all of those higher TEZ and TMZ modes we talked about with the, the JM beta rho rho and YM beta rho rho terms, all of those are below cutoff. And we just get this one nice TEMZ mode. Now, this allows us to do something here. Um, we can take the integral form of Faraday's law, which says that the integral of E dot DL around some loop is minus J omega mu times the integral over any surface bounded by that loop of h dot ds and if we take that surface to be in a plane z is equal to a constant then the surface normal will be in the a hat z direction but there's no z component of h h has only a phi component so this becomes zero and that means that in a plane, z is equal to a constant. The integral of e dot dl around a closed loop is equal to zero. And that's precisely the condition in electrostatics that allows us to define voltage. We can use that then to define the voltage between vector position R2 and vector position R1 as minus the integral from R1 to R2 of e dot DL, as long as the R1 and R2 are in a plane, Z is equal to a constant. And so if we take that and do an integral from the inner conductor to the outer conductor along in the row direction, we'll have, or rather, let's do it uh, 
sorry, let's do it from the outer conductor here at rho is equal to a to the inner conductor at rho is equal to b. Usually we would have the outer conductor would be the ground and the inner conductor would be the, the live wire, the signal wire. So VB uh, minus VA then would be minus E zero B, just using this expression here, the integral from A to B of, and Z, let's take Z is equal to zero. So this, this factor is equal to zero. Then you would have a one over rho, D rho, and that would give you E0B log would be log of B over A, but then minus that would be the log of A over B. So it would be the log of A over B. And that would be the voltage between the two conductors. Now, and here's our coaxial cable. If we look at the integral form of Ampere's law, the integral around a loop of H dot DL is equal to the integral over any surface bounded by that loop of j dot ds plus j omega epsilon, the integral over that surface of e dot ds. And again, if we take this loop and surface to be in a plane z is equal to a constant, and specifically, let's take z is equal to zero, E has no Z component, so that goes to zero. And what we get then is that the integral around a loop, closed loop of H dot DL is, well, this is just the integral of, let's say we take our loop to be here in between rho is equal to B and rho is equal to A, then the this is gonna just get you the enclosed current there by enclosed. And Let's do a specific integral. Let's do an integral from phi is equal to zero to two pi of h phi. DL is rho d phi. Well, h phi's got a one over rho factor and those cancel. And this then simply becomes two pi e zero b over eta. And this is at z is equal to zero. And so that is then the current, right? So we had a voltage difference, which was um, it's called V. So it was E zero B log A over B. And we did this in the Z is equal to zero plane. If we did it in an arbitrary plane, it would have an E to the minus J beta Z. And now here we have the enclosed current, I, and that would be two pi E zero B over eta. And again, if that was in an arbitrary plane, Z is equal to constant, it'd have an E to the minus J beta Z. And these look precisely like the equations for voltage and current on a transmission line. And the ratio of voltage to current is the impedance of the transmission line, Z zero, we'll call that. And what would it be? It would be this guy over that, that Exponential terms cancel, and we would get E zero B log of A over B over two pi E zero B over eta, and that would be equal to eta over two pi times the log of A over B, and probably in one of your undergraduate electromagnetics courses, you derive this expression for the impedance of a coaxial transmission line. Yeah, where eta is the intrinsic impedance of the material, the dielectric that is in between the two conductors.